Principles to follow in following through after a seminar. Everyone has been vexed at times by his failure to follow through on a good project or hunch or job or a course of instruction. Many a brilliant plan has come to nothing because the person who thought it up lacked the spunk or spine to put it across. Many a fine idea has died at birth because its parent put off the job of starting to rear it. Wisdom is knowing what to do next. Skill is knowing how to do it, and virtue is doing it. Merely to step upon the stage does not make a great actor or actress. To be given a chair at a desk does not make one an expert businessman. To take a course a few times does not more make one an expert practice building teacher. To be given a place at a factory bench does not make one a skilled mechanic. Neither does merely acquiring the tools for practice building and office procedure make one a success in a chiropractic practice. There definitely is a reason why one brown bagger can return from a seminar and immediately add to his success while his BB colleague weakens under the stress of ennui. Now, ennui is a Texas word for boredom. Boredom is an emptiness filled with insistence, says a great man I heard one time. Nevertheless, some of the colleagues weaken under the stress of ennui. So we must introduce the idea of follow through. The solemnity of graduation from chiropractic college symbolizes the end of preparation for practice, technically speaking. Then the seminar. Now is the time for energetic doing if one is to make a success of his chiropractic career. The machinery of theory and the stock of knowledge gained at a seminar must terminate in the cutting edge of this direct action of following through. One must have some destination one wishes to reach and then step out. The only thing the Constitution guarantees, you will remember, is the pursuit of happiness. You have to catch up with it yourself. To daydream about far-off places and great achievements can be inspiring, but you must come back to the reality of the starting point. Great men have not been merely dreamers. They have returned from their visions to the practicalities of replacing the airy stones of their dreams, castles with solid masonry wrought by their own hands. You will remember in 1960 we worked day and night and put all of our mental forces and our spiritual forces together to create a brown bagger homecoming, the third one, and attract a thousand people. We did so by attracting 1,037 from all of the ranks and files and factions and members of all associations from almost every state and from almost every province in Canada. And in 1961, at the tremendous homecoming, well over this amount, the fourth time for the fourth homecoming, and again another great increase was shown. How does one go about putting all the seminar principles to work for him and seeing that he does reach the desired objective? There are five things to do. One, fix your purpose. Two, make sure it is the right one for you. Three, search out the ways by which you may reach it. Four, study the details about these ways. And five, get busy. Now, to fix your purpose, a goal is the first thing. 
One cannot hope to reach his desired journey's end if he thinks aimlessly about whether to go east or west. The day he leaves the seminar, he should have in mind the goal he wishes to attain. Did you have yours when you left the seminar, the first, second, or subsequent time? Do you raise this goal each time you come to a seminar? You should. Each time you come for a refresher, the purposes are to raise you a little higher on the echelon of success. Once one sets his goal, then he must move forward. He cannot stand still. Progress may seem slight, and the horizon far away, and the port only a dot on the map, but so long as one completes this beginning stage of the journey of setting a goal, he has achieved the first step toward attainment. Many little things must be done to accomplish a really big thing. If the Wright brothers had sat down at their planning board on December the 16th, 1903, to figure out a scheme of world air transport, they would never have tackled the job of flying. Instead, they tuned up their flying machine, and next morning they put it in the air where it stayed aloft for only 12 seconds, the first heavier-than-air flight by self-powered machine and the vital spark that kindled the life spark of aviation began. Now remember that difficulty provides opportunity. The best way for one to think of opportunity is this. His greatest opportunities will be found in difficulty. When a task is troublesome, that gives him the chance to show his adaptability. When a decision is perplexing, that gives him a chance to show his superior judgment. And many leave the seminar with the idea that they can take home the principles they have learned and just turn them loose, and like little elves, they will run here and there and do all the work. Well, this is true to a great degree, and magnificent result in an immediate influx of new patients, sometimes lasting for months, have resulted in hundreds of instances. But after the primer is gone, then what? Seminar principles have been proved effective, but they don't work altogether by themselves forever. There are no miracles for the indifferent. He is a weak man who depends upon luck for his success. Distinction is not bestowed upon us by some favoring goddess. It is gained through search and work and adaptation of a man's powers to the conditions that surround him. Only when our calculations prove false and wisdom can teach us no more and our efforts have exhausted us without bringing us success, only then, said the wise Roman emperor Hadrian, is it excusable to turn to the random twitter of birds or the distant mechanisms of the stars seeking lucky omens? Nobody in this world ever gets anything for nothing. The sciences of business, sociology, space travel, and chiropractic have this in common. They are attempts to formulate a satisfactory balance between what is desired and the price to be paid for its attainment. Now, there may be a need for adapting to change. It may be necessary to change our methods of practice building and office procedure in the process of following through to success. Among the most pitiful people are those who are trying to fight the 20th century, to live in a past age, to resist change, to refuse to adapt to it. And this is like holding your breath if you persist you kill yourself. The only constant thing in life is change. In today's society, there is no fixed state. The rate of change is so great that a human being of an ordinary length of life will be called upon to face many novel situations, which finds perhaps no parallel in his past. That is the reason we are constantly on the alert for more improved methods of practice building and office procedure and that is the reason that almost every time you come to a seminar, one is always exclaiming, many new things have been added. 
If we stay shut up in our thoughts, we shall never grow, and growth is one of the tests of development. Having got one idea upon its feet, we should swing our searchlights here, there, and everywhere, seeking more ideas to beget new inspiration. That's the reason each seminar is a new experience. If we keep each one the same and never introduce new discoveries, we would stagnate and decay. This, you can be sure, will never happen. This applies to each individual's practices, too, after he returns from a seminar. Now, we have to have courage for new starts, brown baggers. The man who wishes to make his follow-through effective will not do so by timid and tremulous ways. He needs to be able to stand up to buffeting and setbacks. God will not look you over for medals, degrees, or diplomas, but for scars, remember. There may be some discouragements after returning from a seminar. In fact, it is generally true that life seldom gives us any more than just that degree of encouragement which suffices to keep us at a reasonably full exertion of our powers. Following through with the principles expounded at a seminar will be, in some cases, a series of recommencement, some of them after defeats, so that each tomorrow finds us farther than today. When David Campbell drove his boat at 260 and 3,500 miles an hour in 1959, the record-making run was the latest in a series. His father had brought him up on the principle that upon reaching one record, he must set his sights on another. It was natural then that his bluebird gave him the world's water speed record at 202 and 3,200 miles an hour to call his team together and tell them he was turning it up to 250 miles an hour. Now on getting started, Applying at once the material one receives at a seminar inevitably increases the probability of a greater success. While we may see dimly what lies at a distance, we must do what lies clearly at hand. As a proverb has it, the best way to peel a sack of potatoes is to take one potato at a time and peel it. When should we start? Now or wait until we reach a certain degree of success? Plans are useless until steps are taken to realize them. They are like music, silent unless performed, through all the notes that are there. As BBs, you have all the notes. If properly arranged, they will produce a melody of success and turn the noisy rattle of the world into music. Time does not pause for our delays. It waits for nothing before moving on to the next chapter. And it is in the present chapter that we must prove our right to be represented there. Things come to those who wait, but only the things left by those who hustle. He who hesitates, you remember, is lost. If you doubt your ability, why don't you get busy and test it? Now there are the uses of experiences involved. A lot is said about learning by experience, and experience is a great teacher. But if hard personal lessons can be avoided by studying the experiences of others, why not avoid them? That is why you took the seminar to get ten years of practice building experience in four days. That is why you return for refreshers. I have the time, ten, fifteen hours a day, to continue to restudy and improve and modernize practice building and office procedure. I do it all day, every day. Why not take the new things, apply them, and not avoid them? This is experience handed to you on a platter. He is an unhappy motorist, you know, who becomes an expert driver by his own participation in many highway accidents. He is an unhappy businessman, you know, who does not learn except by becoming many times bankrupt. As BBs, you can eliminate many of the pitfalls that may confront you in your practice 
Countless hours of exhaustive research and hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent in producing the seminars and continue to be spent in producing improved practice building school. You can profit by this experience. You have a multitude of tried, tested, and proved methods of practice building an office procedure. It's already been given to you. You need nothing more, really. You need to apply what you've already learned. But they will not work without direction, for they don't know what to do. You must stand over them, guide them, and direct each and every one. Soon you will find they are able to work by themselves. Then you can go to work putting new methods to use. Why don't all BBs realize the success they should after returning from a seminar? Eighty or ninety percent do, but a minority don't. And I feel that it's simply because in most instances they do not follow through. The principles that are received at a seminar are not the goal. They are the means by which the goal may be attained. If you will persistently put the principles to work, it won't be long until they will be working for you. Won't you go back now and begin to restudy the meat and potatoes of all the textbooks and literature and material presented to you? Won't you do this? This is another way to follow through.